Good evening and welcome to our weekly Facebook Live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. It is so good to see everyone. Uh, we're really excited about showing this episode because it's Vancouver and uh, my goodness we just I have such an echo in my ear just so you know. Yeah. It's anyway. <laughs> He gets to listen to me talk. No, I had to listen to myself okay. talk. Okay, just give me a um, But uh, it is, uh, again, really great. To, I'm just going to take this out. No, it's out. Oh, thanks. Oh, he did fix it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, really great to see everyone. And listen, we uh, we just want to send out, oh my gosh, the, the biggest, uh, our thoughts and, and, and our prayers are with Louisiana and Texas right now as... Uh, the hurricane strengthens to, they think, a Category 5, and my gosh, so um, just know uh, we're thinking about you. We have a lot of friends in Louisiana. Of course, we've shot in Louisiana many times um, and Texas many times, and so it looks like it's going to be really serious. So again, it's um, it, when you shoot a travel show for like 20 years, you just feel like you know everybody, and you know and you really feel it when things are uh, turning serious in terms of their weather or uh, natural disasters or w whatever it is and certainly to take this on during the time of the pandemic you just think my gosh how how bad can it get how can it how bad can it get for people and so again we're, we're thinking of you and um, uh, we uh, will be checking in on a lot of you tomorrow and, and the next coming week to make sure everyone in that area of the United States is is okay um, but back to uh, Vancouver. Oh, you know what else I wanted to talk about? My good friend Peter Greenberg. Do you know who that is? He's, he's an icon in the travel industry, a phenomenal travel analyst. He has been analyzing travel for like 250 years. <laughs> Put on book. I hope he's watching. <laughs> that's a Peter Byrne. That's a Peter Byrne. That's a Peter Greenberg. Green, Greenberg. Byrne, Greenberg. You got, um, you got Peter Greenberg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peter is an awesome man, and he comes off as very serious, and he is. He's a serious guy, but we get along very well. Um, and uh, he uh, he does a Facebook Live uh, every Thursday at, at I, believe, I believe noon Eastern Standard Time. And what's great about Peter's um, Facebook Lives is he's very analytical about what's happening now in travel in terms of what you can get in terms of travel insurance, should you get it, why you would get it, why you wouldn't get it. Um, and just all the little, the, the nuances that are moving weekly, you know, Hawaii said they were opening up in July 1st, they pushed it to August 1st, now they, then they pushed it to September 1st, now it's, now it's October 1st, so it just kind of keeps you up to date on what's going on and the ever moving mark of when we can start to travel. But uh, he brought up a really good point, I didn't even think of this, um, because my passport isn't expiring anytime soon, and that is if your passport does expire in 2021, and of course I think everyone wants to go somewhere, of course if you go to Canada you'll need, in, from the United States you'll need a passport, um, but you should know that there, there's just a bit of a backlog right now because they shut it down for a while, all passport services, and now it is back up and running, but certainly not at full capacity, and I believe there's like a, a, over a million passport backlog that they are working through and the agencies are saying they're getting through it don't worry but what usually takes four to six weeks could actually take double that 12 weeks so just keep that in mind i mean no one's going anywhere probably for the rest of the year in terms of traveling internationally but if you are thinking of a hey you know february i could go somewhere or or certainly in the spring and definitely in the summer as you start to look forward to your year of travel just keep that in mind that you you want to um, get your passport renewed uh, earlier than you think just to be on the safe side because there is nothing worse than having a trip planned and realizing um, your passport has expired or you don't have six month validity which a lot of um, countries require and believe it or not you think how could that happen I have a lot of friends that that has happened to um, and even I travel experts Samantha Brown we were it was two years ago we were set to go to Hong Kong and uh, it was March the beginning of March and we were set to go to Hong Kong at the Hong Kong at the end of March and I get my passport out and it expires in uh, June and so I don't have enough time I they, they will not allow me in the country I'm like oh my goodness how could I have let that happen so luckily because we had the tickets and um, I, I was able to get the emergency passport um, uh, issued so that was no problem you but, got a guy and I, I and well yeah I wasn't gonna say that but yeah I've got a I've got a passport. got a passport I don't guy. have a, he's he's gone now he retired so he's, we don't, he's we near don't Canal have, Street New York City <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Exactly. <laughs> On Hudson Street, I guess. Psst, psst. Hey, hey. You want a passport? You want two passports? You want three passports? Um, but I only have one passport. I think a lot of travelers, you know, really sophisticated travelers, find that amazing because a lot of people actually have more than one. Um, I'm not hiding from the law. I've got nothing to hide. I just need one. But it does make sense when you're in a position like me and you have to get maybe um, a, a visa in one country yeah. and you're still traveling to other countries. So I How many passports thought, do you think Peter Greenberg has? Oh my gosh. How? When you live your life like Peter Greenberg, you probably have a lot. I'd love to live my life like Peter Greenberg. Yeah. He's a great, he's a great man and just, a, he's been phenomenal during this whole pandemic. I have looked up to him, looked to him for just what is happening. He, he gets information that I can never find in the, the 20 different newsletters I sign up for to understand what's happening in Travel Today. And so if you're into like nerdy travel news, um, and who isn't, uh, follow Peter Greenberg. Um, but we are here to celebrate our episode of Vancouver. If you have any questions at all, let's see where everyone's coming in from. Love Vancouver. Lots of Texas. Ooh, Ontario. Excellent. Stephanie, just a great name. Um, how, oh, David Dean. You just got burned. I just got burned by my editor. How embarrassing for someone who has four series with passport in the title. <laughs> <laughs> so true it is it's really true um D duncan uh mcpherson's asking questions about keeping the passports and i happen to have my collection right oh here. absolutely you keep your passports and i think there's a real there's always a fear because you do have to send your your, your passport in to get the new passport it's like please send it back and they always do they punch holes in it they punch holes in it and oh my gosh yeah it's, absolutely it's not valid anymore yeah, yeah yeah and i think they changed it now so you can get the full what is it the 52 pager as opposed to the 26 pager um i think my passport's in there it's always good to know where your passport is and i'm just realizing i don't know where my passport is anymore um is that mine nope, it's no mine. okay <laughs> um but uh and let's see where else people are coming from colorado minnesota fantastic st louis uh Michigan, Florida, the Philippines. Oh my goodness. From the Philippines. How are you? Nice to see you. I have, we have never been to the Philippines in, in any of my shows and it's a huge um, hole in, in my travels because when we did our um, Passport to Asia series and all of our Asia, at any time I've gone to Asia, we always meet like bands of uh, people from the Philippines traveling because they're amazing travelers and they travel with their family and there's always like 50 of them and they are as a people uh, the people from the Philippines are funny and they want to have a great time and every time I meet them abroad in other countries I've always loved meeting you so I was just thinking, my gosh I need to get to your to your country just so I'm just surrounded by this North Carolina hello a lot of people from Minnesota Hi from Alexandria, Virginia. I visited Vancouver. It was beautiful. I agree. I think that's what everyone's um, uh, general consensus is, is that it is a beautiful city and uh, one of the most beautiful in the world, if not the most beautiful, because I mean, just in certain ways that it's a cosmopolitan city, but it's surrounded by the wilderness. Uh, it's just got the best of both worlds. A um, lot of great people. Hello from Houston. My gosh, how are you? Are you battening down the hatches? Um, Sam, do you go there? The other people full passports. Uh, but I'm going to try to be better at answering questions. If you have any travel questions, if I can answer them for you. Vera is asking a very important question. Has your husband had a beard for a long time or just since COVID? <laughs> you know, you know, Vera, you, you couldn't be right by putting beard and COVID in the same sentence. It's it really the corona is. beard, I call it. it. Yeah, well, I mean, and, but COVID sounds more dangerous and dingy, which is sometimes... Oh, I like the dangerous part. Okay. The dingy part, you kind of ruined it, but it's just, it's, dangerous. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Corona, that, that, it sounds cool. COVID says what it is. Yeah, he has had the beard since then. Luckily, it's very soft doesn't you know cut up yeah, I'm not, let's see how long it lasts but it's uh it's been a fun little project <laughs> <laughs> doing nothing yeah doing nothing for five months or whatever it is you haven't done nothing that is far from the truth yeah. should we tell them what we're drinking yeah i was trying to find if anyone asked to comment no one did so Everyone's uh, just saying hi. this week's um cocktail was a gin and tonic and I, I was gonna do like a fancy cocktail but no it's like it's still summer and you know gin and tonic is like the most summery drink of all and um, the, I always knew this was going to be this gin, which is called Empress Gin. It's not from Vancouver. From, it is from British Columbia. Nice. I think from the t city of Victoria, I think. Wow. Um, the Empress Hotel there. And it's purple. And it's really cool. It's, there's a, it's called the Butterfly Pea Blossom that they put in to color it. 
the butterfly pea, pea blossom. blossom, and that's a flower. It's yeah, like a little bud. It's beautiful. It's, and so. And does it flavor it at all? Do you think? I don't know if it's for flavoring as much, but it um, it's got a really nice color to it. But it has a cool little party trick that when you put tonic water. Oh into wait, it, wait, you get okay because we got to show. Kevin gets very serious about his drinks, and look at that. We even have ice spheres today. And he, we have this new contraption so we can do the clear ones. So it's and, clear. Uh, so it's got clear ice. And Kevin and I always had a dream that we wanted to start an ice of the month club where we would send people certain like ice trays with different shapes plus like a bottled water from around the world, you know, from like, you know, pristine areas. So still, you can make, still might have so it. yeah, that's so true. But I love ice and ice absolutely changes a drink. And of course, if you buy a, a refrigerator, you just get those awful half moons that just, they're awful and they make, drinks like like shoot down the back of your throat it's just the worst ice you could possibly have so um we are very serious about it changes that. color see that huh it goes from purple to pink oh huh? see look at uh, that uh, yeah it smells fantastic yeah. so this is from victoria from from british columbia cheers cheers everyone cheers Oh, I tell you, there's nothing more summery than a nice gin and tonic. Um, so uh, we love Canada. We have shot many times in Canada. Our first season, we were in Vancouver, and right after our Vancouver episode, we shoot four days. We flew across the country to uh, shoot in Montreal. Two, I mean, you couldn't pick two different cities, right, in terms of their history, in terms of yeah. what they look like, in the same country. I don't feel like we really have that in the United States as much, two major cities. Uh, maybe do, but I feel, yeah, I feel like Quebec City is you know, it's like 500 years old, 400, yeah. so 350 years old, and Vancouver just is gleaming and, and, and brand new and surrounded by nature, of course. And, uh, and then this year, for season four, uh, we our very first episode and our only episode we shot this year in February was Quebec City in the winter during Winter Carnival. So again, we have a lot of love for Canada. And... Um, and we um, are excited to say that we will be uh, heading there in March, I mean, oh, May, I'll be heading back. I'm going to be hosting a Rocky Mountaineer train trip along the Continental Divide. This is going to be so amazing. You stay in those cars with the gla glass domes and um, we get to just absorb like the phenomenal nature and going over suspension bridges and our massive bridges and just being engulfed by the, um, would it be the Rockies? Yeah, it's yeah Canadian the Rockies. Canadian Rockies, right. The Canadian Rockies and um, and then stopping along the way at the wonderful uh, Grand Pacific Railroad hotels in Banff and uh, Lake Louise, uh, two places I have not been yet. I cannot wait. And you stay at We're going to be hotels. filming on the, sh on the train. Filming on the train, exactly. Yeah, it's exciting. Hopefully, maybe we could turn it into like a murder mystery because I'm a huge... I feel like um, I would be the one murdered. Agatha Christie. If there's someone murdered, it would definitely be the husband. So let's pass on that one. It's, it's a bad idea. He was found uh, with his COVID beard with an ice have, spear to his chest. We have a lot chest. of witnesses now. That, you know, <laughs> this is going to be saved forever on Facebook. You um, thwarted your plan. Yes, yes. Um, so with that, I think we should start. And yeah. Oh, just one thing about the Rocky Mountaineer thing. It's only available booking-wise through AAA. We're going to be putting a link on our website tomorrow or by Monday at the latest with, you know, just how to, how to reach out and find out details and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting. You know, obviously we're, we're supposed to do that this May and it was postponed. So mm -hmm, we're really looking mm -hmm. forward to, we got all excited and had to kind of. Yeah, that was one of the ones I could not believe. When, when we shut down in mid-March, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, two weeks, that's not bad. Three weeks to let this pass. Oh well, yeah, we'll definitely be on the Rocky Mountaineer and just to see where we are today. Um, but we move on, right? And uh, yep. we'll be there and we kick off the Rocky Mountaineer, Mountaineer trip in Vancouver, of course, oh, with yeah. a cocktail yeah, hour. Yeah, a cocktail party before cocktail we leave. Cocktail hour, yes, yeah. exactly. Cheers. And I think we might be doing some cocktails on the train. We'll definitely be doing cocktails on the train. And I think for the cocktail hour, we wanted to do... A Caesar. A what? Caesar. Like a Caesar salad? Caesar is the Canadian version of the Bloody Mary. Oh, okay. I was like, I'm, I'm, I didn't know that I've was my I've done my contract. research of that. I couldn't I, tell you what... Remember the Caesar what, salads? What kind of animals side. we'll see along the way, but I can tell you the cocktails okay. well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I think in the Rocky Mountaineer ad, they have a grizzly bear. I'm like, that's exactly where I'd want to see a grizzly bear, on a moving train going yes. past it. Um, so let's start this wonderful show because we I've shot in Vancouver three times and um, the city just gets better and better. It's again that you've got the nature, you've got culture, you've got 
Um, just uh, I, I love the the, the different um, communities there, uh, Granville Island, where all the artisans are. It's just it's a phenomenal city. I know everyone uh, would love to go there. So this uh, episode it. will get you ready. When it comes to cities, this one makes everyone's most beautiful list with a sensational confluence of glass towers, mountains, and sea. But it's also got ambitions, and its people have set out to make this city the greenest in the world by 2020. It is clear that the people who have called it home for decades to a millennia love it even more. I'm in beautiful British Columbia in the city of Vancouver, Canada. I'm Samantha Brown, and I've traveled all over this world. And I'm always you know, looking to find scouting this episode, it was I hadn't been there before, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun going to Vancouver for the first time, just because it's one of the cities was you, that hear the first time you, yeah, went? you hear about. Yeah, you hear about it a lot, and it's just you know, it's a really special. And did it live time. up to the hype? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah. pretty awesome. <laughs> Europe is a treasure trove of fascinating history, so now you're history, seeing our sponsors culture, for season one on the waterways. On the waterways I'm, I'm River Cruise offers a way to see well. all the details of that one next week. Oh, good, great. Yeah. But you can there are two ways you can actually travel with these. These are just, could be Facebook live events. They're actually live oh. events, um, which we love. I would say, you know, one of my favorite um, memories is of the Vancouver smell of fresh is uh, I was stuck in a holding pattern on a it's flight. It's a place where giants still live. You're for 45 minutes over the city where you're in a holding Pattern, and it was the Away is where the farther down the like, road it's you the go, you, you never the want to be in a holding you pattern. You're just the circling and circling, love. and then you start to get nervous, like, why are we circling? Find we're your land, and we're running out of gas. And for 45 go minutes, we just got to fly over that beautiful city and then go out deep into, like, British Columbia, the mountains, and, oh, my God, it was actually sad when we, we had to land. <laughs> One of the icons of Vancouver is, of course, Stanley Park. And people call it a refuge, and I always think, a refuge from what? A gleaming city on pristine waters next to glorious mountains? What's well, not a refuge here? Uh, but it is a refuge. It's also a playground, as well as an emblem of why the city of Vancouver has become one of the most sustainable and livable cities in the world. And even though this park sustains 8 million visitors a year, it still holds its secrets, and there's still plenty to discover. Vancouver is often yep. uh, talked I'm about as being a really future. new. Is that oh. line up? Sure. Okay. Yep. So uh, we're here shooting at Stanley Park, and here's my crew, and there's Brian Miller with the with the camera on his shoulder. He's my DP. There's Chelsea, assistant cam, uh, Chad with the sound. He's got like the baby carrier in front. Christina, uh, Sylvia, my director, and uh, Michael, our executive producer. Now, um, see um, Brian, Chelsea, and Chad. Uh, two camera and sound are from Seattle. And so plaid is their favorite color. And so they always wear plaid. And they don't even know it. And so one, at this first day of shooting, we all got together and like we all need to wear a plaid shirt and need to see how long it takes for the Seattleites to realize that we're making fun of them. <laughs> and, I didn't know that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so we, we didn't tell them. We just kind of be like, hey, how you doing? And and this was the moment I think Brian was like, wait a minute, you're all wearing plaid. So I just thought that was a little behind the behind the scenes, uh, get to know the crew shenanigans. Um, we, we really enjoy being with each other and one thing we love most to do is to pick on one another So oh, yeah, and then we had yeah, then we've got that one one's and then two. is that coming over? I can Why don't you talk picture? Yeah, okay. I have another picture that wasn't ready so okay, uh, well, we can start the show Yeah. So. City yeah. and yet there are elements of it that are absolutely ancient Stanley Park truly is an an ancient city, so to speak. It has been a village site for people for literally millennia. My name is Candace Campo. I am a member of the Seashoth and Squamish Nation, and our people have lived here in Stanley Park for thousands of years. At its height of the First Nations being here, how many would have lived here in Vancouver? Well, I know the Squamish people themselves numbered 30,000 people. Candace leads people on what she calls yeah. a Talking Trees Tour of Stanley Park. This here is one of my most favorite trees. It's the Western Red Cedar. Mm -hmm. And it's actually referred to as the tree of life for our people. Why is that? Because some of the purposes that it had were really vital to our society's well-being. 
we actually carved cedar dugout canoes. Mm -hmm. And with the ability to access ancient trees, we'd be able to build a canoe that was 60 feet long wow. and even six to eight feet wide. So oh you could gosh. travel great distance. You can carry many of your family members and community members. What our people um, sought to practice was sustainable harvest. So where we would have to utilize a full tree for a canoe to build our homes, we would literally harvest the plank. The plank? Yeah, so, so that's you would a... take a plank out of a healthy tree and you would take several planks from several trees and allow the tree to live. So you're just yes. taking sections of the tree, yes. build your home, and the tree could go yes. on. Yes. The forest allowed us to have a really good life. I feel like the city of Vancouver wouldn't exist without this park. It would never be the same for sure. Yes. It gives it like 100 exclamation points. I mean, just that the trees itself and being here, it does not feel like we are in a city of millions of people. It does. You can hear the birds. You can hear yourself think. It's a friendly park and it's very accessible throughout all seasons. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I don't feel like I, I don't remember me saying so, but uh, Stanley Park is massive. It's like a, a close. It's like under just a little under a thousand acres, and it's a it's a rainforest, and there are thick thick forests within this park. And yeah. I can um, uh, one of my favorite things to do in this park, and I've been going there I've, every time I, I've gone to Vancouver. Um, I go to this swing set, and this this is no joke. There's a swing set right at sort of the entrance of the park. And why I love it is it's like a swing set from the 70s. And by that I mean it's really a tall swing set. It's like 20, 25 feet, mm -hmm. and it has the extra long um, chain. And so you can get like the most height you have ever got. Like now all the swing sets are safety. They're only eight feet, like you can't get any height. And I used to love going to the swing set because I love being on a swing. The last time I was there during the show, there was a lot of kids and I realized, oh, like, like an old lady like me, I can't take the swing from a child. So <laughs> I didn't get to go swinging on this, but just so you know, if you go there, like check out the swings because if you're my age and you remember swings, it was the swings of the 70s and the 80s where, you know, um, your parents didn't mind if you had head injuries. <laughs> there, there were no high hopes for us so as children. So. You know, one of the interesting things, I don't think this made the show because there's, you know, so much to so see. much great points that, that uh, she was making but that you know a lot of the first nations were kind of nomadic and they moved around a lot they fought, right. they followed the mm -hmm. seasons and mm -hmm. they followed the hunt or whatever they were you know and they all I think they all had different kind of ways that they did that but um, Vancouver was a stable place they, they made more uh, uh, permanent structures there because and it all came down to the salmon because oh, right. the salmon was so plentiful it brought other animals in and bears and eagles and just you know that that they didn't need to move around to follow the food the food was just always mm -hmm, there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it, it was kind of a unique more, not totally unique but just a more unique uh, way that they lived compared to some of the other it was amazing when she said that about 30,000 people lived yeah. in here that is a phenomenal population but all because of salmon mm -hmm. it's amazing Here you have the salmon berry, and it's the very first berry that comes out in the season. We actually believe the bear was our teacher, and the bear taught us what foods to eat. And of course, when the bear comes out of hibernation, he will eat the salmon berries as much as he possibly can. Yes. Can you uh, eat those now, or um, is that they're, something They're that... actually ripe. I would um, love to invite you to try one. There's two, here, Candace. One berry. for me, yeah. one for you. Exactly. It has a very fresh taste. And I believe it's only as you're listening. Berries. Don't pick the berries. Don't wonderful. take the bear's yes. food. Now, would those be eaten for um, medicinal purposes or just because they tasted good? There's no separation uh -huh. between medicine and food. It's considered the same that. thing. And as such, cooks in our society are highly respected. When did you open up your restaurant? We opened during the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics. Was there something about the Olympics that you thought this is a good time? It was an amazing time. And I thought, you know, the whole world is coming here. They need to be able to try food from the land. What a good point, because when you come to Vancouver, first, like you say, people all over the world come here, and then food from all over the world is represented here. Absolutely. And yet, not the first food. Yeah. Every 
Candace has taken me to meet Inez Cook at her bistro, Salmon and Bannock. It's Vancouver's only First Nations restaurant. Do you have a lot of First Nations people come here and enjoy your food, or is it really just the, the diverse crowd that lives here in Vancouver tasting it for the first time? We have all types of customers. Um, the First Nations are super happy to come and have traditional foods that they can't get normally or mm -hmm. regularly. So that's introduced us to more of the world, and it's, it's great. I mean, I'm, I've never done this before in my life. Awesome. So I'm just good. This is the fish, this is the fish head. And yes. do I eat the whole thing? The whole thing. Yeah, the entire thing. It is. Yeah. Okay. And yes. this is where, like, watching yeah. this for the first that time. That is fantastic smoke. This is like we're watching this for the first time. I, I watched this this afternoon, and I realized we never explained that fish. Like, when you go back and watch some of the episodes, you realize some of the mistakes that you made. And, like, I believe that fish was really important. It only came the out. The candlefish? Uh, it's super oily. Yeah. It's a stain. You actually can light it on fire. Is that right? Yeah, because it, it has so much oil in it, and you could light it on fire. So I don't know why we didn't explain that. Um, my, my fault. But so I do watch these, and I'm like, oh, man, we, we missed it. We, we didn't, uh, why didn't we talk about that? But we do talk about this next um, item, which is uh, important in their own oh, name of their restaurant. Original food in a modern way, with a heavy focus on wild game. Beautiful. This is um, an elk shoulder, okay. and um, our chef has prepared it. Um, the style of an asabuco. The cool thing is, is that there's still the marrow in the bone, okay. which you'll be able to put on your bannock. Oh, lovely! And this is the bannock. This is a part of your name. Yes, so this it must is. be very important. The indigenous people were making their own unleavened bread for years, and when the Scottish people came, they showed them how to turn wheat into flour. And the Scottish people called it bannock. So the First Nations adopted that word. And all across Turtle Island, which is North America, they have done their own versions. And this is our, our way. So this is my elk also buco. Yes. Food is how Inez reached out to others, and it's also how she got back in touch with her own roots. You had a different upbringing than, than Candace. Yes, I was adopted. And um, I actually met my biological family through the restaurant after I opened. It was all over the media that a New Hulk person had opened this restaurant, mm -hmm. but because I was adopted out, nobody knew me. So it when was, you say you were adopted out, what does that mean? Um, it was a time period where the government went into the communities and adopted the children to non-native families. So and, this is um, all learned. It's all learned. I make jokes and say I'm a born again native. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm super happy showcasing my heritage of pride. And would your tribes? Have known each other? At one time, we probably weren't friends, hey? <laughs> probably not. <laughs> no, we weren't, to be honest, but that was several hundred years ago. That's changed. That's <laughs> so 700 years ago. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna stop right here. So obviously, when we did Vancouver, what we loved is that the First Nations culture is alive and well, and it's not just something these like historical placements where you go to how they used to live. It's really how they and yeah, just incorporate and are part of Vancouver life today. And we love that, um, the fact that we can interact in, in modern ways. And uh, one of the, what, what was the hotel? One thing that didn't um, make even the, the show, because we thought, we okay, we have a lot now. We have not only the, the only First Nations restaurant, but also the wonderful Talking Trees tour with uh, Candace Campo. But the third um, First Nations um, uh, subject we wanted to cover was this wonderful hotel. So I'll tell it. Uh, I'll tell you about it now. What's it called? Sw I can't. I have to look at the word to know how to pronounce Shop, it because. Shop, uh, um, but it's a First Nations hotel. Squatches. Squatches, and it's S K W A C H A Y S. Squatches Lodge, um, and it is again uh, First Nations owned. It's a small boutique boutique hotel. And it's the first indigenous arts hotel. So not only is it owned by indigenous peoples, but also each room is decorated and um, and and painted by uh, certain uh, uh, artists, First Nations artists. Uh, so really great. We we just loved this. One of the reasons why it was going to be hard to do this is we we wanted to stay there, but we have so much gear. In yeah. the end, we like we need those like Hampton Inns. We need those. And it's not a big hotel. We it's not a big hotel. Over. We would have taken over. But, you know, I, I had the for good fortune of, of scouting that that uh, this episode and got to see a bunch of rooms and they're then beautiful. Yeah. They're all unique and different and gorgeous and, and you know just the way that they were put together was yeah. was second to none. And in the basement of the building, they actually have a workshop that. Um, 
First Nations can come in and do woodworking or you know sculpting or whatever they do, you know the different media that they use for art, that they have a space to do make their art oh, in, that's in the basement of the of the hotel. Inviting uh, just anyone to yeah, come in. Oh, just a really special place. And yeah. just we just pull up their website. They just reopened two days ago. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Great news. Great news. And uh, Seven and Bannock is still open. I think it's all takeout, but they're still going strongly. Um, and so uh, that's it's really nice to know. And I, I would imagine Stanley Park is still up and <laughs> doing well. Um, yeah. So these these are all great stories, right? So, so when you watch the episode, I would I would look into Squatche's Lodge. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's really I'm, just just search First Nations Hotel Vancouver. First Nations, yeah. yeah. And uh, go to Salmon and Bannock, and and, uh, and and of course our next. You but have before to we get to that scene, I have to bring up. We were talking about uh, the our plaid loving crew. Yeah. When we were in Baltimore. A couple years ago, we had a. It got ugly. Yeah, turned out. Yeah, oh, nice. Half the people were half. wearing red plaid. Uh, and the other half. I think Chelsea's wearing the exact same shirt. If I'm not mistaken. We're wearing blue plaid. And yeah. It got ugly. It got ugly. And this yeah. is the, the mean streets of Baltimore, <laughs> Fells Harbor. And. Uh, and we didn't plan that. It was kind of like an anchorman style fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Except but, we were all PBS. And no one planned this. So also we went, we, you know, we start our day and we're like, wait a minute. And we're all, yeah, we're, exactly. half the crew is wearing salmon, pink, like how specific a color can you get? And the other is wearing our their traditional plaid. So yeah, again, we have a lot of fun. Here we are at Granville Island. Granville Island is a very popular destination. It seems like everybody in Vancouver is at the public market. That's why I love these quiet, tucked away places. Right, right now I'm walking down uh, a street. It's called the Railspur District. And every single one of these studios are uh, occupied by artists. And everything they make is unique and made by hand. Wow. Are these all handmade brooms? Yes, they're all made by myself and my sister. And you, you make them all right here? Right, right here, here in the shop. We make over 4,000 brooms a year. Oh my goodness, these are works of art. How long does it take you to make a broom? Uh, it takes anywhere from about a half an hour for a simple little whisk broom to over three hours for some of the full-size natural handle ones like that. This is gorgeous. So this is a natural handle. Yeah, and it's always a week-long process from start to finish because there's a lot of different stages. So no broom is made in a single day. That is a tremendous amount of care and love and hard work that goes into <laughs> something that does a lot of hard work. Yeah, exactly. Our brooms are made to be used. Feel free to try them out. I mean, these are gorgeous. Why do people pick uh, the round brooms as opposed to the flat brooms? Is there a reason why people prefer one or the other? Yeah, yeah the round ones cover a large that. area. Yeah. Basically, a broom like that is meant for sweeping big open spaces. So you don't need a totally straight handle because you use it more like this. Oh. So you can just dust off the deck or driveway really quickly. I feel like this is this is my broom. <laughs> what do you have? This one is a hockey stick broom. Come <laughs> on! Is that not awesome or what? It's yeah, about the most Canadian broom you can get. We have a lot of fans who play hockey, and so whenever someone breaks a stick, they bring it to us and we build a broom onto it. So how do uh, helps men work too? women come about doing such a, an old craft? Well, we actually grew up with it. So it's something we learned from our parents. So they, they, your parents made brooms? Yeah, so when we were growing up, we learned how to make brooms throughout our summers in high school and university. It's mm -hmm. how we put ourselves through university. So we decided to come back to it and start this shop here about seven years ago. It's a great combination of just like constantly talking to people as well as doing something fun and creative. So how many bad witch jokes have you gotten because you're two sisters who make brooms? <laughs> it comes with the territory and mostly, you know, as long as people are entertained when they come in, we're happy, so. <laughs> What is it about um, Vancouver that makes it such a great city? For me, it's definitely the outdoors thing. Yeah. I spend most of my time in the backcountry, so the fact that I can go skiing after work, I can go sailing, I can jump in the ocean, to me it's like a small town almost because it's just crammed into the mountains and I love it. And you can do that all in one day because you can ride your broom? <laughs> <laughs> Speeds things up a little. <laughs> there, I got my witch joke in. I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> so, I had so many witch jokes that I didn't, I didn't, and, and the obvious one in the room that I never got to do was my name is Samantha, mm. and for the first 10 years of my life, 
everyone uh, asked me if I could wiggle my nose. Um, it, it, Facebook, do you know what that means when someone says, hey, can you wiggle your nose? What sitcom they are referring to? Um, of course, that's uh, Bewitched, and because her name was Samantha, and so and uh, and so no no I couldn't wiggle my nose but anyway that was there was again so many I didn't even know which one to choose. Did so. you wake up that night like oh that was oh, a good one? Gosh my name is Samantha. <laughs> 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 All right. Can I <laughs> So I don't know sakis at all. I'm really intimidated by it. Do you get that from the people who walk into your time. shop? Yeah. All the time. It must be nice that you get to talk personally to people. Yes. To really introduce not only sake, but your sake. When I can convert their thinking or, uh -huh. or attitude towards sake, then that's the day that really, really makes me happy. Masa, I am here to be converted. <laughs> My name is Masa Shiroki. I am an artisan sake maker here on Grand Bell Island. Masa's specialty is soft-pressed sake, which is also made right here. Soft-pressed actually come, uh, brings a very soft, uh, natural flavor mm -hmm. and aroma of the, of the sake. We don't have filters, we don't have a, you know, accordion-like uh, press. All right. Uh, so it takes 48 hours for us to press. 48 hours. As versus to 4 hours, 5 hours if okay. you use a machine. So, so which one should I try first to really so understand think, what you do here? I think you should try this first. This is called Jumai, which means only three ingredients are allowed to be used. All right. Uh, rice, water, and yeast. Strong. It is strong. Uh, it's 15% only, though. Fruity aroma, pear, mm -hmm. melon. But where is that fruity aroma coming from? A lot of people actually ask that question. And, and it's a combination of the particular rice that we use, yeast, mm. and oh. the temperature. That's lovely. That we made Smooth. It. So how is this product different? So I just want to say, um, me describing things that I taste and eat, I'm, I'm terrible at it. And the entire time I'm tasting it, this is 20 years I've been doing this job, whenever I taste something, I know the camera's right on me and I start to like, oh gosh, how am I going to describe this? Because I really don't, after all this time, I don't know how to describe flavors. And so if you'll watch this, I think this episode in particular, I taste a lot of things and I either say, oh, that's lovely or, oh, that's wonderful. So if you want a, like a new drinking game, I would, I would just offer that up. Like every time I say, oh, that's lovely. Um, but I'm, I'm, on the back of my mind, I always think the camera's on you and now you have to say what this tastes like and you have no idea. Because in the end, I just really like it, but I don't know how to put that to words. Um, I wish I could work on that, but I just can't say, so, oh, that's lovely. Than Japanese sake. So compared to that one, is this less flavorful or more flavorful? I would I would say it's more flavorful. Okay. The sake that I've had in Japan, it was very dry. Yes, your answer is very correct. Okay. Um, because a uh, the way that we make sake is to have more acidity okay. and uh, more flavor because uh, our market is not a Japanese restaurants or Japanese nationals here. Um, our market is you know, mm -hmm. Canadian in general, because it just, they just opened up their mindset uh, to accept sake, mm -hmm. that it can come into my life. Canada seems a little cold for rice. We can grow rice here, no question about it, but uh, there are two factors that are helping us. One is that the people love local products with the, uh, the spirit mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. a sustainable, Mm -hmm. and natural and local. We, we can capture a people's emotions. Mm -hmm. We can get right into people's heart and say, you gotta support this uh, because he's not wasting anything he's doing with sustainable practice and uh, he's doing everything natural. So there's market here, definitely. Right. I firmly believe that uh, we can leave some legacy uh, onto, uh, onto the land that uh, we've been so fortunate to live and, and uh, uh, bring ourselves up. Um, uh, and. Hopefully, uh, this will perpetuate. A place that highlights Vancouver's diversity is the night market of Richmond. Richmond is its own city in the metro Vancouver area, and it seems like its entire population is here, experiencing great food in a carnival-like atmosphere. So Colin, when you said we needed to get here early, you were right. This, this is the beginning and it's already packed. Yeah, this is going to get even more packed as the night goes through. They typically get about 10 to 15,000 people here a night. 10 to 15,000 people? 10 to 15,000 people. And they run from 
April all the way into early October. It's really crazy here and you know it's not just locals who, who come here. I mean it's people from all around the region but we get also a lot of people from the states because we're so close to the border. Plus we're so close to Vancouver International Airport we get a lot of visitors from overseas who are just popping into the night market for something to do. I've been lucky enough to go to Asia many times, and especially China, and you have to go to the night markets, right? You because you can get everything. I, if I need socks, a cell phone case, and food, uh, I've got it. I'm in, the, I'm in the right place. Yeah, you can get some right really yeah. unique products here. So one thing we could not show, uh, and we were saying do not show this, is socks. <laughs> Were you there? Did I tell no. you about this? Like, because so if you ever go to Korea, the best thing to do is go sock shopping. They've got the best socks. They're the little ones, and that you get like ten packs for ten, the equivalent of ten dollars. And so here it was at the Richmond Market. I'm like, oh my gosh, they've got socks. Oh, when we turned our cameras on, they were like out. So I don't know what's happening. I'm with sure those it's socks. because they were all licensed products. Yeah, they did not pay a license yes. for. But they didn't pay for Hello Kitty and yeah. Spider Man. Yeah, I'm sure. But I mean, whatever. But it was it was very funny. It was just like just uh, that just became the joke throughout the entire night. It was just like just don't please please don't show. And Brian was like, I could get a shot of those socks. Like, no, it's okay. I don't want to get in trouble with the sock people. No, no, no. <laughs> or like we were trying like, well maybe we could shoot because that's like a big thing. Like whenever I go to these markets, that's what I buy. I buy socks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, when, when I scouted that, there were so many awesome vendors there. Yeah, yeah, try, exactly. Just trying to pick, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it was, you know, and it was the, like there was the biggest line, and I, I think it's kind of like a competition. Like the biggest line in the whole place was for this like rotary potato thing. And we'll show it. Well, that's in there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was uh, it was you a. You scouted right at. Okay. No, no, it was a challenge trying to find these uh, these things. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a challenge, it was like, what It's we amazing do? that we're just like 25 minutes away from Vancouver, and yet Richmond really is its own, own destination. Yeah, 65% of our population is Asian. And what generation are you? Uh, my parents were born and raised in China, and so I'm the first generation born here. The first generation, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. <laughs> For a lot of Asian food, it isn't just about the taste, it's about the presentation. And this is a Chinese candy known as Dragon's Beer. Love that. I want to get a box of those. That looks great. It's like cotton candy. They're pulling it by hand. It's lovely. So when I talked about diversity here at Drink. the night market, this is, what I think, <laughs> a prime example. It's about evolving food. So here we have Ohana Poke. This is my spin on it. So it's like a combination of flavors that I think would work well. We tried to make it pretty just because people don't know what it is, right? You gotta make it Instagrammable, right? <laughs> it's gotta be Instagrammable. Oh, believe me, I know what it's like to always have to look good on camera. <laughs> A lot of people, you know, they're kind of afraid of squid. But if you do it right, it's fantastic. The sign says we have no spicy, a little spicy, spicy, and very spicy. <laughs> Great, wow. thank you. This means we paid. Now we get in the back of a line, a really long line. <laughs> two, I would two say that, um, and that's your now that, that I'm, says you paid. Uh, well, I do so many of food shows, uh, are the, 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 food, the subject of food. I love the things that aren't Instagrammable. And I actually, we stay away from that sort of Instagram aesthetic where things are just kind of social media inspired. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, 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 the less um, Instagrammable, the better in my book because it's all about taste. It's not about what it looks like. And, and I think, a uh, 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 thing of squid and our next meal kind of um, uh, highlights that. So this is Chef James. He looks like a chef. He is a chef. <laughs> For his day job, he's actually a chef at a big hotel in Vancouver. <laughs> he's got, a he's got the headset on there. You no, know, Chef James is a real the show. Four seasons. Well, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Friday. So you've never had lamb kidneys? I, I can't say that I have. So yeah, we can get chicken skewers. Instagram that. Right, it's good. It's really great. Okay, awesome. let's, go, let's go get dessert. Uh, oh, a mango mochi. Coconut chunks of mango. You get the tapioca pearls. It really washes down that lamb kidney. <laughs> Trust me, you will never grow tired of watching planes take off and land on water. And getting That's in one true. is even more of a thrill. And the Vancouver Seaplane Terminal is located right next to downtown. Hi, you Samantha. Hey. Welcome to Harbor Hello. Air. Yeah, thank you so much. interesting about Harbor Air, I think Vancouver has the largest fleet of seaplanes in the world. 
and it really is amazing. You go to a terminal, a seaplane terminal, and you have to do this. If you go to Vancouver, it's just yeah. a must because you'll see where we are headed out. But Harbor Air just made the announcement that they are going to be changing their entire fleet over to electric with zero emissions. Wow. They, they finally have the technology to do that. And that is their, their next mission because Vancouver, of course, is a very green city. I think it aims to be the greenest city in the world as well. And um, what, a, what a great um, motivation, what a great um, a goal. And nearby what a, neighborhoods that. That amazing. And then headed out to get a closer look at the beauty that surrounds Vancouver, as well as the natural Gorgeous. majesty of British Columbia. Oh. And so you grew up in Vancouver. So you have a total appreciation for this, I would imagine. Yeah. Or or is it just something that you're like, yeah, that's okay. No, I love it for sure. You can't you can't grow up here and not appreciate it. You, most people that live here spend a lot of time outdoors, so. I've taken a few float plane rides before, but never to a second location. That's gorgeous. Mm. It's, it's, it's hard to believe. Mm -hmm. All right, we're yeah. here. All right. It's hard to believe you're next to such a big, you know, in a big city that just has that. Yeah, and I think so. We we did two locations. Like we flew over. You can keep it rolling. Yeah. Um, we flew over uh, these glacier lakes that are uh, inaccessible except for hiking, and you're deep. You're deep in the woods and the mountains. And then the lake where we landed, uh, he was telling me we were probably like a 30-minute drive from the city and there's a parking lot even though I mean but it's still there's only one little parking lot and so you still have it to yourself of course no one can build on this lake so even though you're 30 minutes from the city I mean we live in New York City 30 minutes from New York City is just more city like <laughs> yeah. it never ends here to have something like that this for us is a good three hours four hours away um, yeah. so again this is why this is one of the most beautiful cities in the world it's just this is where they can come for for the day for for an afternoon not that many people in Vancouver get to come experience this every day and true, feel true. lucky to come out here. There's no angle, there's nowhere this isn't just absolute paradise. Yeah, it definitely is. All right, time to go. On to our next adventure. You ready? Have a third stop this is on my pretty amazing itinerary. what we did here we're like i know we're yeah. to, to meet because we always want to kind of like connect our scenes i think i told you about that last year last year last week um covid <laughs> so but uh, we always try to connect our scenes in a more interesting way other than like you know after this i went here so we're like how about because our next guest you're about to meet um he fishes off the water so like how about we meet him on the water so we did a trade off and um i don't know if you just roll it let's see maybe um because i mean and then i meet him yep here he comes <laughs> and shooting this is like your your heart is in your throat because all of our, of course our our camera and our team are on like trying to get off of seaplanes as well and you see like a hundred thousand dollars worth of gear and like people like put in these positions of like hovering over passing cameras to each other yeah. and oh my gosh and just to get a, um, a very quick shot <laughs> like that I don't know if I do that you again. know I, I felt like th this was when we were talking about this when I was scouting you man it was just like wouldn't it be cool if we could do this and getting the Harbor Air team to agree to it, you know, because they're not used to doing that kind of stuff, and you know, getting the boats, and you know, and just it was one of those things that wouldn't be really cool if we could do that. And and, and you know, I I wasn't there for the shoot, so I was just kind of like bothering everyone. Every, every, oh, it, that's right, you were really how's bothering it going? everyone. How's it going? Everything okay? Did it go? Did it go? Did it go? Yeah. Did it go? Yeah. But yeah. it was. Uh, we actually had a the final scene of this was supposed to be a, a big uh, cookout. That's right. That we just couldn't make it work. It was just where we were in the, in the harbor and. We spent a lot of time trying to figure that out that we could have yeah. like a big, like a beachside yeah. party cookout, and then you would kind of roll up with the crabs, and everybody yeah. would be like, hey, kind of like a beer ad, you know, like, hey, we got the crabs, oh, Here's you got the time, you got the, you know, yeah. But anyway, it was uh, it worked out really well, and no, Ned, Ned's uh, really great. Oh my great gosh, guy. yeah, he's just a emblem for sustainability. Is the sound going? Thank you. 
so close to the city and such a beautiful spot. spot. Isn't it amazing? Where am I now? I just came from Pitt Lake. Gorgeous. Right. It's like mountain fed. Pretty awesome. Lake. Float plane ride in. I know. Unbelievable. I know. And it's just about to get better. So we are in Deep Coves. Yeah. And just up that way, back behind us, is called Indian Arm. So this is just like so close to the city and such a magical place. We could see killer whales here. We've got seals. We have all kinds of delicious things right beneath us. I am I'm so Ned glad Bell. we didn't see I'm a chef, I'm a father, and I'm a champion for our world's oceans. And you talk about delicious things. That's what we're on I our way to right now. We are. So I set some crab traps earlier. Nice. So you never know what you're going to get right, in a crab trap. You the could sea get gives us what it wants. It sure does. I mean, they call it fishing, but really it's hunting. And what type of crab are, are we going to be hunting today? Yeah, so where we are is just north of Washington. In Washington, there's a place called Dungeness. Oh, and so sure. the crab here is yeah. called Dungeness Crab. We're so lucky here in oh Greater Vancouver and in British Columbia to be surrounded by wilderness, surrounded by the ocean, and just surrounded by these extraordinary places that give us so many delicious things, life and, and you know, the ocean is the lungs of our planet. I would imagine with your approach to seafood and sustainability that the Dungeness so Crab is something right here? that is sustainable. Absolutely, it's sustainable. I mean, I often get asked, oh, yeah, yeah. what Let's is sustainability? What does that mean? You know, and so for me as a chef, it's obviously got to be delicious. I'm making another drink. It's coming from a wild, well-managed fishery like Dungeness Crab or so many of our fisheries here on the West Coast. It also includes responsible aquaculture. But us as guests in restaurants, in retail, grocery stores, etc., we're asking, I just don't know where my seafood is from. I don't know my fishermen. I don't know where they caught it, how they caught it, when they caught it. But it's also about making sure that we're leaving enough for the next generation, right? We're leaving enough for the next season, the next year. Oh my goodness. There. So I'm not gonna lie, these were totally planted. These crabs, they're, they're uh, equity crabs. They're part of the SAG union. <laughs> they were paid. They were. Uh, they <laughs> We had we have to plant, and anytime you see we do like a fishing scene or whatever, we have to plant the the fish. It has to be something that's been already caught and kind of you know they're ready for us because we will never be able to catch anything on camera. We have tried my earlier years, and it's like we gotta go. We don't have time. So um, what you're about to see is both Ned and I amazing acting and really great acting from the crabs too. And didn't the one actually? Sorry, just to add to that, I believe the ones you bought died in the water. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it was a... Yeah. 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 What? Really? Oh, he's gorgeous. Oh, come on. Look at oh, this. Oh, my goodness. That is a haul, I have All to right. tell you. You're good luck, my dear. <laughs> you are good you. luck. Huh? This is what Vancouver is all about. This is the wild west coast in a crab trap. And you know, this this guy is, is actually a keeper, but yeah. I'm gonna throw him back. Because I like we're being it. generous I today. Like it. <laughs> a Two traveler to Vancouver will find awesome everywhere. Globally inspired, locally created flavors and people that want to share it with you no matter where you're from. Our people have a really strong spiritual connection to the land and we would like to share our knowledge of sustainable practices with community and visitors. People in Vancouver are very curious to uh, new things. People are so open and free in their thoughts and I decided to come here and I wanted to join them. When we feel the exhilaration lifting off the sea and soaring into the mountains, when we look down at a city and know that the people below are committed to make sure that all the beauty you see is protected, that is when we share a love of travel. And that's why Vancouver in British Columbia is a place to love. For more information well, I hope you about enjoyed this that and other little bit of, of uh, gosh, Canada. Canada, beautiful Canada, um, for those of us who can't travel there. Um, and But we have some special guests from the show. Yeah. Uh, because last week was so successful with our friend uh, from Huntsville, Danny Davis, that we thought we need to keep this going, especially when these are great businesses and great people that we met and just totally enjoyed, and just to check up on them, see their, if they're okay, and, and know in the, in the travel world, we're all a part of this wonderful community of supporting local businesses. And uh, it's so important, it's more important than ever. And we've got one question. Look at that craftsmanship of these women brew makers. That's right, let's look. 
at these women brew makers. Hello, Sarah and Mary, how are you? Uh, hi, Kevin. <laughs> How's um, it going? Nice to see <gasps> <laughs> you. <see. laughs> oh, I love your backdrop. It's perfect. So you're clearly yes. in your shop. We are, yes. Stay a little nice. late for work today, but it's, it's yeah. earlier here, so. We appreciate it, we appreciate it. <laughs> um, it is so good to see you. It has been at least three years, and yeah, um, yeah. we had such a wonderful time shooting in your um, in your shop, and I learned so much about broom making, but as, as, as I was watching the, the uh, segment, one thing we, I believe we talked about on camera, um, uh, Mary, you were like, you know, sewing, I believe, at the, and you have that leather thing in your hand, because how long is that needle that you are kind of sewing through the broom? It's yeah. about eight, eight inches long, probably, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good size. <laughs> and what's great about, for those of you watching the Facebook Live, both Mary and Sarah, like they say, they, they're making the brooms as people are going in and they're talking, and yet what they're doing can be quite, like, almost dangerous. Until you can hear a crunch, you can hear things, it's just like, have you ever been hurt by that needle? Um, you know, <laughs> I would say no, except for just this past year, our, our one employee, Stephanie, did cut herself. She's been... She's been using it for seven years with no injuries and had one minor injury last year. Oh, so okay, it can happen. And it actually, happen. when I was growing up, when I was yes. first, when I was younger, I used to slip sometimes. But we also had different hand um, hand protectors at that time, and they're yeah. much better today. They're safer <laughs> now. Yeah, they're yeah. safer. We upgraded our safety standards. We after. used to make them ourselves, and now we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you had the same 1970s parents I had, where it's like, if you get hurt, whatever. Like, that's a part of being a child, just getting hurt. Yeah, but when I people watch you... us work... Oh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, when people watch us work, it com we often get comments like, oh, your mother would never let you do, you know, like, your mother would never approve of this. And we're always like, our mother taught us how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I love this story, if you can elaborate a little bit more about how your parents um, were broom makers first, and this is how it was just maybe like a summer job or after school job for you. Um, just kind of explain yeah. how long your parents actually um, um, have this craft, and are they still doing it? Sure. So basically, um, yeah, we were little kids when our parents were looking for a business to run um, for themselves. And my mom was actually the bookkeeper of some broom makers who had learned in California and brought it to Canada. And so basically it was just kind of a perfect situation where my mom took it over. My dad kind of came along for the ride at the beginning and ended up pretty fast realizing that it was going to be a full-time business for both of them. And uh, yeah, and then we, you know, we got put to work pretty much right away, stamping tags and stitching brooms and, you know, just kind of helping out. So it was just down the hill from school. And uh, yeah, we spent a lot of time in the shop growing up. Um, our parents are retired now, so they don't make brooms anymore. But uh, our cousin has taken over the business from them. Um, so it's a different business, not here in Vancouver. And uh, yeah, so my cousin is running it now. And so it's still in the family and still going strong. Wow. Yeah, it's in a very small town called Crawford Bay. Yeah, on, in um, the Kootenays. In the Kootenays, yeah. How, how far from Vancouver is? 10 hours. Oh, cool. <laughs> about a 10 hour drive east. Yeah. And you have to cross a ferry to get there. So it's very isolated, very remote part of the world. Whoa. And uh, three mountain passes. Three mountain passes. Yeah. Oh my gosh! So, what made you want to settle both uh, both settle in Vancouver? Did you go to a university there or school, and you just wanted to stay? Both of us came to um, the coast, Mary to Victoria, and myself to Vancouver. And um, yeah, we both loved it out here, and and did really want to stay, and but still wanted to be part of the business as well, like mm -hmm. to still make brooms. So um, I guess it was, well, yeah, it's our 10 year anniversary. So 10, 10 years ago, um, <laughs> we opened a shop. Yeah. Not, not today, but this summer. Not so. today, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, this summer we are 10 years old. So, uh, well, I mean, but having real estate, uh, renting a shop in, on Granville Island can't be cheap. So you really took a chance of saying, hey, um, people are going to want this, this beautiful craft, which is based on a, a tool that we use every life, uh, every day. And wouldn't it be nice just to elevate this tool, but bring in how, you know, the, the, the craftsmanship of how this, uh, a broom has been made. Like, did you, 
did you think that that was uh, taking a, a huge chance or did you feel like you already had the support of people of Vancouver really liking their artisans? You know, when we, for us, it was kind of a no brainer. We grew up with it. We knew it spoke to people. It's such a humble, simple thing, but like you say, kind of elevated. Um, but in the city, people thought we were crazy. Like, I think people thought it was a bigger risk than we thought it ever was. So, um, but you know, as, as they saw it work, everyone kind of came in and said, oh, I, I see now, I see why, like, yeah. I, I get it yeah. now. But they, they had to see it to believe it. And not everyone had been to the other shop in person and, you know, and saw our family's business, so. Well, I think what, what's, and beautiful, about, oh, sorry. Uh, what's beautiful about what you do, and you certainly saw me come to the shop and, and do that scene, you, all of a sudden, you have so many questions about brooms. Like I, 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 you know, the round brooms, you know, ones that you just, you just let the porch broom that you, you don't need like the stiff, thick, short, um, straw, you know, you could just need something that just kind of sweeps that, sweeps that dirt off, you know, in, in large <laughs> swaths and, or, or just the more tedious ones. I bought two, actually I bought three. I brought your small, I call them like whisk brooms to get like the mm -hmm. snow and the dirt off of your boots, you know, when you come inside. Yeah. And then I yeah. have my beautiful broom, which I love, which is up, we have a place upstate, it's a 180 year old farmhouse. And, oh, nice. uh, and so that's cool. where my broom is because it needs to be in a farmhouse. It's, it won't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't <laughs> like Brooklyn. And uh, I think you so got a fur broom, I remember that one. Yes, exactly. Now, could you explain yeah. the handles and, and the process of acquiring those handles and how they become a part of your art brooms? Mm -hmm. So the handle on your broom is actually from out in the Kootenays near where we grew up, uh, where my parents are. And so that one, um, my dad actually collected for us. Oh, um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so we get a lot of um, wood actually out in the Kootenays. Um, the fir um, that you have, as well as some birch. Um, and then sometimes we get some other woods as well, just depending on what we can find. Um, but where my parents are, it's very rural, so there's a lot of options. And actually they have a 100-year-old orchard, which we sometimes get some cherry wood from, oh, and cool. apple, which is really cool. When we get those, it's, those ones are pretty special. Um, and then our really twisty handles that you see, um, yeah, actually right behind, just behind yeah. here, yeah, yeah, a lot of these ones. These ones we collect down in Arizona. So these are manzanita wood. Um, so when we collect the wood, it's all dead wood, um, but we still have to go out and, and, and collect it. And then we do a lot of sanding work to get into the grain, um, and then it's got a, an oil finish on it. So all the colors and everything are natural. Um, yeah, really, really extraordinary wood. And part and of our do you dad's retirement. Sanding too? Yeah, so we do some of it. Um, and part of our dad's retirement job <laughs> project fun time is uh, is helping us out now. So our dad does quite a bit of it as well. Yeah, <laughs> we've hired. Now him. you're putting him to work. I love it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, busy. How, uh, yeah. Um, so how has the Granville Island, how's Granville Island been uh, coping in these really difficult times that the entire world is going through? But just give us yeah. an update on how, how Vancouver and Granville Island and its artists are, are faring in this. So it's definitely quieter around yeah. here these days. Uh, we all shut down for about two and a half months. Um, mm. The market was open for like essential food shopping because of course it's also kind of a grocery store. Oh, okay. But it was it was really interesting because you know artists never stop and we all have our own studios and we could all get safely to them so like if you came down here we were close to the public but all the artists were busy at work um catching up on projects doing commissions uh we were filling mail orders so you know it was it kind of had this little quiet world still bustling underneath the surface um and yeah we're open again it's yeah, since June 1st. <laughs> it's quieter, but uh, we're, you know, we're getting through. More mail orders, we're kind of focusing more on that to balance out the, uh, the loss of people. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's good Let's to be back. Uh, tell, tell people watching what your website is where they can order a wonderful broom. Yeah, it's broomcompany.com, so pretty simple. And uh, we do have an online catalog. And now we, um, so we used to just kind of have sample types of our brooms, but now we actually do photograph individual brooms because they are so unique 
we give them names. Uh, so a lot of our brooms have really random names now, and uh, so you can actually pick exact brooms out as well. So what what are your names? We do that because well yeah we do that because we were used to being able to have people come in and choose their own broom and they can try them out and feel them. And so we've been giving them names because they all have so much personality, right? So, um, yes, yeah. like, let's see. This one, which you can see has very like cool, Whoa. lots of features. Oh. So we named it the Ember because it reminded us kind of of fire and like, mm -hmm. the, yeah, nice. coals. So yeah, there's lots of, lots of good names. Yeah, this one, let's see. that? Trying to trying to put the website up didn't work. Ah, uh, it better work. <laughs> no, this one's got kind of some floral tones, so we call it the hibiscus. Lovely. I went through a bit of a geology kick people, for a while. And I would imagine people um, commission you to do some. You're, you know, I'm looking for a cherry, you know, a, a, a cherry broom handle and long and do, so. Can you get as customizable as that? We can dig through our, you know, our pile. It it, it depends. Um, it's hard to just You're sort like, of go Dad, out and find, find a cherry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're exactly. like, that's gonna cost a lot of money. <laughs> um, but you know, we do. Uh, we rebuild brooms for people if they have some old broom from somewhere else. We build brooms onto custom. You know, sometimes people have a paddle or an oar or a hockey stick or whatever they have that they want a broom built onto. Um, just a cool piece of wood. Cool piece of wood, fireplace sets that need rebuilding, you know, we'll cut off old brooms and put ours on them. So we do a lot of work like that for people, for sure. I bet, I bet. Well, I think one of the um, moments of the pandemic that really hit home for me was when our borders closed to each other. Yeah. Yeah, all of a sudden it yeah. became really serious. I'm like, oh my goodness, we are closing. Uh, you know, Canada's closing our, their border to us. We're closing our border to you. It was all of a sudden, it was just holy mackerel this is serious because of course yeah. our countries have been so, so you know on such friendly terms <laughs> and we've had such an exchange of of, of oh, yeah. artists and and experiences and um like i said i i have uh, already i have plans to come to vancouver in may <laughs> and i will be yeah. stopping by to seeing you because i just miss you guys oh, and great. i hope you are doing well and um yeah. thank you so thank much you. for joining us Thank you so much. Thanks okay. so much yeah, for having yeah, us. Yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so great. So, I mean, this is, again, what we get to do in our, our work. We get to meet phenomenal people who pour their heart and soul into their businesses, um, really exploring their passions and making us aware of of things we would have never. Like, I, 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 I never thought twice about a broom, but as soon as you walk into their shop, you're like, oh, my gosh, it's these are works of art and then honestly like sweeping every day it just becomes lovely it just becomes this lovely daily ritual and so um and so it was really nice visiting uh, mary and sarah again and i can't wait to visit them again yeah. it's really nice and i tell you you know when we do an episode you put a collection of stories and ideas together but the brooms, the, the, when people talk about our Vancouver episode, they talk about the, the brooms. brooms. The brooms, yeah, exactly, because it's in, it's an unexpected surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Everyone, you can read the comments now, like, I love the brooms. Yeah. We went to the brooms. One of our uh, diehard fans, she had, is it Tanya? Wasn't she Tanya Cooper? Was that? Tanya Cooper, yeah, she went yeah. to the, yeah, we don't have a picture. Yeah, she uh, she yeah. said on Facebook, Tanya Cooper, that she... She went to the store and got a picture with, with the sisters. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah, exactly. Um, so people are really excited. And I think, and, and again, I think people love um, supporting uh, yeah. small businesses, female businesses that, you know, especially ones that really, um, you know, uh, reach back into just the quality of how things used to be made and, yeah. and just, just the love of everyday items. So, That's great cool. stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Vancouver. So beautiful. Um, any questions we should ask? Yeah. Sam, um, did you pick up a broom? I flew it home. My name's Samantha. Uh, um, yeah, oh, sorry, bad joke. That was no, bad. No, but you have we have three? You gave one as a gift, right? So we, we, we have two. The little one and the big That's one. That's right, yeah. And I gave the little, yeah, little one to your dad. My brother. For his golf, no, your dad. For his golf shoes, I thought. Because my brother posted that he got one. Did your dad re-gift it? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <sighs> um... <laughs> But yeah, so that there's been a lot of questions about you know it's it's um, broomcompany.com, and they do ship their brooms. Mm -hmm. and, uh, That's it's how funny. I got mine. I didn't yeah. I didn't get it there because we were moving on to Montreal, right. and I was like ah, and so I just had it shipped, and it came yeah. you know like a week later. So it's really easy to get. Yeah, so. and our friend Michaela Malazzi from uh, Barefoot Travels 
bought one for her mom for Christmas. Is that right? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great. She's like Christmas shopping done. Oops, I hope her mom doesn't watch this. See, I lo oh, well, I mean, I, I, oh, wait, that's a joke. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I do, I do love sweet, um, sweeping, and I would say at the end of every day at this pandemic, being with my kids and everyone's home, that that just sort of ritual of just like cleaning and cleaning the house and just having this beautiful broom and feeling um just that that lovely uh, just piece of wood um it just it it really it really is it really helps you know it really is lovely just to go back um i think there were some questions about just so that we can uh give the name of the tours for kenneth campo yeah um that's thanks paula amos for yeah. and for i would say all of this information, including the Broom com uh, uh, Company, Telesay Tours, everything's on our website, yeah. samantha-brown.com, Samantha and it has links, direct links, um, to these places and businesses and Candace. So yeah. there, we don't hide anything from you. This is everything we do is totally accessible to the traveler, and we want you to do exactly what we did. You can book tours for advance. You can buy brooms. You can get some sake. And um, so that's what the show is about, so that everything I do, you can do. So we make that really easy on our website. Uh, Christina Zambudo had a question. Anything you always have to have on your carry-on with you, Sam? Yes, where, maybe I have them. Oh, darn it, I think they're in the, go on my desk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or maybe I, I think somebody asked this. Well, okay, we'll just say this. Uh, it, peanut butter. Tomorrow, the uh, AAA. Oh, well, no, that's right. No, I, can't. I don't, actually, I was going to say peanut butter, but that's not my carry-on because peanut butter is a liquid. And believe me, I've had it confiscated many times because I've tried to sneak peanut butter on a plane and it, it won't fly. So uh, I always travel with peanut butter. I always travel with, oh, that's right. Yeah, exactly. I always travel with, a teacup. That's my teacup. So I love traveling with a teacup and I wrap it in a thick athletic sock, unused of course, and it really saves it. Um, and because people are like, why would you travel with a porcelain teacup? And I love it because when you travel as much as I do, and every day you wake up and you have to like take the plastic off of the styrofoam cup to put the coffee in, I, one, you just get so tired of just all the waste. And um, two, there's just something really lovely about starting the day with a real, uh, a nice cup of tea. I even travel with my own tea with my teacup. And one time um, in New Zealand, uh, this saucer broke in half uh, in my travels and I just had it out on the counter of my hotel room. And when I came back, the housekeeper had um, glued it back together with a little note saying, we saw your saucer. We glued, I glued it back and um, I was like, I'm not the, that one, that person that like, I come out for like a half an hour and you can only like not look at me is to get an autograph and then I go back into a room like, I party. Like, I, I hang out, like we do things together. We have a lot of fun. Kept, well, I party until like 9 p.m. and then I have to go to bed, so, but um, yeah. But uh, um, but it's just, we have a really great time. I know whenever I've done the river cruise tours, um, river cruises, we've had such a great time mm -hmm. with, the, with the actual passengers. And so Rocky yeah. Mountaineer will be, you no, know, oh, I can't wait for that Rocky Mountaineer one. That's gonna be phenomenal, yeah. Um, all right, so, um, this is a, I feel like I wanted to put this up there. Someone asked a question. It's a really good kind of, uh, I know it's hard to read that, but the um, question is why in season two is the North Island, we did a show called the Central North Island episode of New Zealand, yeah, okay. and why is it not available to watch? Um, it's a great spot that that's not available. We have filmed, we released 39 episodes, 13 a year for three years, but one is not available, and it's that episode, and that's purely because we did a scene at the White Island um, volcano, and um, at the time it was a really safe place to be and it was a really beautiful scene and really interesting and everything else but uh, and that was at, that was in December of 2019 correct it erupted and I believe 15 people were killed on the yeah. island and yeah. so um, and we landed on the island on a helicopter we went right up to the caldera you can see the water yep. steaming I made a joke about whoa we're on an active volcano and we just felt it was in really bad taste yep. and and you can't go there now so you know our plan is to re-edit it somehow um, so we can yeah re um, put put it back up so Aaron that, that's out of respect for those people that lost their life and just you know it didn't seem right to leave that out there I agree um, lots of questions about brooms I, I know everyone loves the brooms they're be they're beautiful they're works yeah. of art. And everyone's like, oh, you know what? Maybe I would actually clean more if I had a beautiful broom. Because when you have beautiful things, it does it does help. A lot of people, you know, I might need those brooms. 
Mm -hmm. We bought a shaker broom. Um, yeah, I'd say, you know, selfishly, when I did the scouting for this episode, it was, um, of all the things, having never been to Vancouver before, I've also never been on a float plane before. And that was the one thing, like, because sometimes there's just certain situations where I don't need to experience everything. It's, I, I see it's enough, and it's if it's like a three hour thing, and I have a lot of other things that day, but I, I might not do the whole experience. I might just kind of check the beginning and the end out and say, okay, this is perfect. That's all I need. Move on, move on to the next thing. But it's like, I am going on a float plane. I'm doing that trip. And it was awesome. Yeah. It was really a fun experience. Just taking off in the water, oh, yeah. landing on the water. It's just, yeah. It is. As someone asked, it's a I, must. I don't have the question up. I think it might have been our friend uh, Kerry Kyler, but um, asked uh, or, no, someone asked about how many people can fit in them. The, the Harbor Tours have different sized float planes, and I think the one that we did held five, including the pilot. I think they have smaller ones, but they're not they're not huge, like you know, thirty people on a. It's it's they're a very small, intimate kind of thing. So, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But uh, really cool. And those, some of those planes are pretty old, you know, it's, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not, <laughs> I say this delicately, uh, the idea that you are on kind of an older plane sometimes might freak you out, but it's really nice that you can land anywhere there's water. <laughs> that makes you kind of feel a little more better about everything. That, that you know, is true. You don't have to make it back to a runway somewhere. Yep, yep, yep. Um, maybe great, yeah, I like that one, great years, but yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, great, you are supporting and promoting small businesses. I, I totally agree. That's really what um, uh, Places to Love is about. Uh, it's about the people behind the businesses because I feel like, you know, we don't understand the effort that goes into all these experiences that we as travelers just get to show up and have. And when you find out people's backstory, all you want to do is support um, that effort, right? All you want to do is whether you can buy something online, right, or just show up there. Um, that's that's what small businesses are all about and it's really up to us especially now more so than ever now to make sure that the small businesses that we love continue to have our business and I find that uh, as a traveler when you understand the backstory of, 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 of these businesses of these artists um, again, you want to support them and that makes you feel less like a consumer and more just a part of the community. So it all ties in. I think, you know, as, as a traveler, you're just inherently um, a, 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 a consumer. You're buying, you're buying so many things. But if you knew um, just, uh, just how hard people work to have their businesses and businesses they're really good at, it makes it a really easy decision to support that, I think. Yeah. Um, Stephanie... Uh... Dinatale. There we go. Um, how long do you recommend staying in Vancouver for a, a trip? At least four days. Yeah, I'd say four days. I mean, it, it's um, you know, weather can be spotty there. It's the it's specific type northwest area. That... I gotta tell you, every time I've been there, it's been spectacular. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah. Um. But you know, you can get kind of socked in with rain, and mm -hmm, that kind of mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I know when we filmed there, it was three gorgeous days. <laughs> yeah. 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 Every time I've been there, it's been been pretty good. Yeah. Um. But yeah, because I think you want to get out. It's not just about the city itself. Oh, I agree. Yeah, so and, four days in the city. And then, you know, there, yeah. There's a whole, I think it's called Grouse Mountain. That's about, it's like a really common day trip that you go out and, and there's like a it's not like, have viewing, like 600 stairs or there's something. There's like a viewing platform mm -hmm. that you can kind of see the, you know, the, or, or gondola or something like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. Or you can uh, take the stairs. Um, you know, you have you know, the market. If the, the, the one thing about the Richmond um, food uh, experiencing that that's not year round I think so that's only on the weekend so that, that might be mm -hmm. seasonal if you're there you might be able to catch that certainly if you're in town when it's there it's it's, it's worth doing Anna Pell come to Monterey um, yeah but uh, I think what other that's yeah, a great you know easy to get around mm -hmm, city. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, oh Tanya oh no Tanya, yeah. yeah. That's who, I think Tanya is the one that sent us the uh, picture that picture. she was at the broom shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with the sisters. Um, what month did you film in Vancouver? I think it was uh, July, early July. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's why it was so beautiful. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we were, because I I drove up with the kids to meet you in Montreal. It was like July 4th, I think. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. So, we were there the uh, first few days of July uh, three years ago. Nice. Right? Yeah, three yeah, years three, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite snack at the night market. Do you remember? 
Well, I love that, that mango mochi because I love mochi. Oh, I thought that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. It was also pretty warm too, so it was really refreshing. Okay. Um, the lamb kidneys, not so much, but I was up for anything. Well, I, I had those skewers. I had just like normal meat ones, not like a, mm -hmm. a kidney, but they were really... We talked the other day in our Shanghai episode about how the food you get in... Um, the Chinese food you get in America is quite different than when you get in China. Like, I really felt that was Chinese. It was like from China, like really heavy spiced, but not, you know... Yeah. Now, the, those skewers were great. Yeah. No, I agree. Just don't get a kidney ones and you're good. I think. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Did we see the steam clock in Gastown? Um, we showed we, it in the We day. showed it. Yeah, there's yeah. a quick B-roll shot of it going off. Yeah, um, yeah. I think what we like to do in, in our shows is I know they're the obvious... Um, icons of a city and, and, and destinations and, and we kind of know that going in and um, and we, we I would say we avoid them but we just think what else can we show um, because anyone to any sort of uh, travel site or um, website that's what's going to come up first is you know the, the steam clock and, and is it cast town yeah, cast cast town. Town. yeah. and uh, and so we um, you know we just just decided that okay, we're gonna show other things, but we'll we'll show those things like in B roll. We just won't like spend time really talking about them. So we do that a lot. Um, great question by Debbie Perry about bad weather. Um, we purposely filmed the seaplane scenes in the first day, so that if we had bad weather, we could have pushed it back. In the end, the weather was gorgeous all day, the whole time, so it wasn't an yeah. issue. But whenever we do scenes like that, where weather it's contingent upon weather. We do it in the beginning of the show, I mean, in the beginning of the shoot, so we have yeah. a buffer. We have a few days, and there's a few days that we can do it. And sometimes we've had to push, the, push things three days in advance. You know, we, we thought we were doing yeah. it the first day, and nope, we're doing it actually the third day, and then it gets close. If, you know, if we look at the weather and it's definitely raining a certain day, we might just say, all right, let's just plan it now, and let's just push it back uh, two days ahead of mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing with the flow planes is that, uh, at least what they're saying, is that it's not like you would have been bad shots. They just don't fly. So exactly. we, we just couldn't have done it. It's not like it would have been, been, been bad. Which bad. love when people make that. Yeah, but it's not like it would just, oh, it would have been bad to film and you had, the, the visibility wouldn't have been great. It's like they just wouldn't go up at all. So yeah. you yep. know, we, we were concerned about that. Oh, great. Um, there was another question. Um, where to next in Canada? Well, we're going to start in Vancouver, but in, then we'll be taking the train. Yeah. And I'll be going to Banff for the first yeah. time. So that's and, in May. And Lake Louise. Towards what? the end of May, I think just been. Uh -huh. I think that's. Uh, but the, um, you know, we're we're talking about possibly doing some shows around that time in British Columbia and in Alberta, kind of on bookends with the idea that trains kind of in the middle of it. So mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. we're hoping that still happens in May next year, um, because you know we've done Montreal, Vancouver, we did Quebec City this year. So there's big parts of Canada we we haven't we haven't been to. So yeah, you know. Yeah. And you know, my dream one day is to do a Winnipeg, uh, like a Manitoba story. We do kind of half in Winnipeg and half in Churchill, which is where like the polar bears are and all that stuff. Yeah. You are just like hell bent on getting me with bears, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Manitoba. It's awesome. Oh, I know. Well, I, I, I have no, a, I have a Canadian. Um, what was it? The Canadian goose jacket. Yeah. Well, there's there's a there's a spot in Churchill, Manitoba, that it's like the, this last part part of land that as either the spring happens or fall, whatever it is, that all the polar bears kind of get to that point to go out hunting. So there's just like a and they, they have these huge like trucks you take it. You're not just hanging out with polar bears. It's like a safari. Yeah, I've seen that movie. I know how it ends. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, We're good. Yeah, a couple of things. So we have, uh, so tomorrow, just to mention at 4 o'clock, we'll, we'll be putting stuff on Facebook. We're doing a, a fun webcast where Samantha's going through the Rocky Mountaineer trip and the Alma Waterways trip for next year with AAA uh, as a sponsor, but they also help put these things on, these, these uh, trips. Um, in five minutes uh, on the Create Network, our Vienna episode's airing. If you want to keep your Samantha Brown marathon going. Uh, From Vancouver to Vienna. Yeah. We're doing um, all the V's today. So that's that's in five minutes airing on Create on your local Create station. Uh -huh. And then next week is Texas Hill Country. Texas Hill Country. One of my favorites, yeah, yeah. And you know, we always talk about what our cocktails are going to be. We already know what our drink next week's going to oh, be. Is it just going to be beer? 
No. Oh. We still have a bottle of wine from the winemakers we featured. You came home. Oh with my! It. We still have a yeah. bottle of wine from yep. them. So we'll be <laughs> drinking. How did that happen? Some uh, Great Hill Country Texas wine. Fantastic! Yeah. Oh, wonderful! Yeah. Did you do that on purpose? Did you hide that from me? Maybe. Said, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Oh, so that'll wonderful. be our drink next week. Nice, yeah. nice, a nice simple. Yeah, and so that'll be fun. Uh, Hill Country next week. Someone and... also just asked about your drink. You want to reiterate what you uh, oh. what this is because this is um, gin from. Yeah, so our British gin Columbia. for British Columbia from Victoria is called Empress, and it's actually. A... Sorry, the lights. Kind of this is not me. an ad. We're not sponsored by them. No, I'd love to be, but we're not. Um, <laughs> but the Empress Hotel in Vancouver, sorry Victoria, um, has a kind of a deal. They make this gin, and it has you know some cool stuff. But the thing that makes it really unique is it's purple. And as you put acid into it with tonic water or citrus, it turns it pink. So it's kind of a fun cocktail thing. I, I had hoped to do a more fancy cocktail. And why do you have a, a grapefruit slice in it? Seem cool. Oh, okay. Well, all right. A little yeah. different. Because, uh, yeah, like a green lime would look a little strange. It would look like yeah. a, like a yeah, green so the, yeah. Okay, Something nice. different. All right. All right. I married well. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We yeah. had another great evening with you. We will see you next Wednesday at 9 p.m. where we discuss Texas Hill Country. Texas Hill Country. Take care. Good night.